Book Twelve. They are ill at ease, replies he, because many things arise which distract their thoughts, and their minds are disquieted by conflicting opinions. I admit that this is true. Still, these very men, foolish, inconsistent, and certain to feel remorse as they are, do nevertheless receive great pleasure, and we must allow that in so doing they are as far from feeling any trouble as they are from forming any right judgment, and that, as is the case with many people, they are possessed by a merry madness, and laugh while they rave. The pleasures of wise men, on the other hand, are mild, decorous, verging on dullness, kept under restraint and scarcely noticeable and are neither invited to come, nor received with honor when they come of their own accord, nor are they welcomed with any delight by those whom they visit, who mix them up with their lives and fill up empty spaces with them, like an amusing farce in the intervals of serious business. Let them no longer, then, join incongruous matters together, or connect pleasure with virtue, a mistake whereby they court the worst of men. The reckless profligate, always in liquor and belching out the fumes of wine, believes that he lives with virtue, because he knows that he lives with pleasure, for he hears it said that pleasure cannot exist apart from virtue. Consequently, he dubs his vices with the title of wisdom, and parades all that he ought to conceal. So, men are not encouraged by Epicurus to run riot, but the vicious hide their excesses in the lap of philosophy, and flock to the schools in which they hear the praises of pleasure. They do not consider how sober and temperate, for so, by Hercules, I believe it to be, that pleasure of Epicurus is, but they rush at his mere name, seeking to obtain some protection and cloak for their vices. They lose, therefore, the one virtue which their evil life possessed, that of being ashamed of doing wrong, for they praise what they used to blush at, and boast at their vices. Thus modesty can never reassert itself when shameful idleness is dignified with an honorable name. The reason why that praise which your school lavishes upon pleasure is so hurtful is because the honorable part of its teaching passes unnoticed, but the degrading part is seen by all. Book 13 I myself believe, though my stoic comrades would be unwilling to hear me say so, that the teachings of Epicurus were as upright and holy, and even, if you examine it narrowly, stern. For this much-talked-of pleasure is reduced to a very narrow compass, and he bids pleasure submit to the same law which we bid virtue do, I mean to obey nature. Luxury, however, is not satisfied with what is enough for nature. What is the consequence? Whoever thinks that happiness consists in lazy sloth and alternations of gluttony and profligacy requires a good patron for a bad action, and when he has become an Epicurean, having been led to do so by the attractive name of that school, he follows not the pleasure which he there hears spoken of, but that which he brought thither with him, and, having learned to think that his vices coincide with the maxims of that philosophy, he indulges in them no longer timidly and in dark corners, but boldly in the face of day. I will not, therefore, like most of our school, say that the sect of Epicurus is the teacher of crime, but what I say is, it is ill spoken of, it has a bad reputation, and yet it does not deserve it. Who can know this without having been admitted to its inner mysteries? Its very outside gives opportunity for scandal, and encourages men's baser desires. It is like a brave man dressed in a woman's gown. Your chastity is assured, your manhood is safe, your body is submitted to nothing disgraceful, but your hand holds a drum, like a priest of Sibylle. Choose, then, some honorable superscription for your school, some writing which shall in itself arouse the mind. That which at present stands over your door has been invented by vices. He who ranges himself on the side of virtue gives thereby a proof of noble disposition. He who follows pleasure appears to be weakly, worn out, degrading his manhood, likely to fall into infamous vices unless someone discriminates his pleasures for him, so that he may know which remain within the bounds of natural desire, which are frantic and boundless, and become all the more insatiable the more they are satisfied. But come, let virtue lead the way. Then every step will be safe. Too much pleasure is hurtful but with virtue we need fear no excess of any kind, because moderation is contained in virtue herself. That which is injured by its own extent cannot be a good thing. Besides, what better guide can there be than reason for beings endowed with a reasoning nature? So if this combination pleases you, if you are willing to proceed to a happy life thus accompanied, let virtue lead the way. Let pleasure follow and hang about the body like a shadow. It is the part of a mind incapable of great things to hand over virtue, the highest of all qualities, as a handmaid to pleasure. 
Book 14 Let virtue lead the way and bear the standard. We shall have pleasure for all that, but we shall be her masters and controllers. She may win some concessions from us, but will not force us to do anything. On the contrary, those who have permitted pleasure to lead the van have neither one nor the other, for they lose virtue altogether, and yet they do not possess pleasure, but are possessed by it, and are either tortured by its absence or choked by its success, being wretched if deserted by it, and yet more wretched if overwhelmed by it, like those who are caught in the shoals of the Surtees, and at one time are left on dry ground, and at another tossed on the flowing waves. This arises from an exaggerated want of self-control, and a hidden love of evil, for it is dangerous for one who seeks after evil instead of good to attain his object. As we hunt wild beasts with toil and peril, and even when they are caught find them in anxious possession, for they often tear their keepers to pieces, even so are great pleasures. They turn out to be great evils and take their owners prisoner. The more numerous and the greater they are, the more inferior and the slave of more masters does that man become whom the vulgar call a happy man. I may even press this analogy further, as the man who tracks wild animals to their lairs, and who sets great store on seeking with snares the wandering brutes to noose, and making their hounds the spacious glades around, that he may follow their tracks, neglects far more desirable things, and leaves many duties unfulfilled, so he who pursues pleasure postpones everything to it, disregards that first essential liberty and sacrifices it to his belly, nor does he buy pleasure for himself, but sells himself to pleasure. Book 15. But what, asks our adversary, is there to hinder virtue and pleasure being combined together, and the highest good being thus formed, so that honor and pleasure may be the same thing? Because nothing except what is honorable can form a part of honor, and the highest good would lose its purity if it were to see within itself anything unlike its own better part. Even the joy which arises from virtue, although it be a good thing, yet is not a part of absolute good, any more than cheerfulness or peace of mind, which are indeed good things, but which merely follow the highest good, and do not contribute to its perfection, although they are generated by the noblest causes. Whoever, on the other hand, forms an alliance, and that too a one-sided one, between virtue and pleasure, clogs whatever strength the one may possess by the weakness of the other, and sends liberty under the yoke. For liberty can only remain unconquered as long as she knows nothing more valuable than herself. For he begins to need the help of fortune, which is the most utter slavery. His life becomes anxious, full of suspicion, timorous, fearful of accidents, waiting in agony for critical moments of time. You do not afford virtue a solid, immovable base if you bid it stand on what is unsteady. And what can be so unsteady as dependence on mere chance, and the vicissitudes of the body and of those things which act on the body? How can such a man obey God and receive everything which comes to pass in a cheerful spirit, never complaining of fate, and putting a good construction upon everything that befalls him, if he be agitated by the petty pinpricks of pleasures and pains? A man cannot be a good protector of his country, a good avenger of her wrongs, or a good defender of his friends, if he be inclined to pleasures. Let the highest good, then, rise to that height from whence no force can dislodge it, whither neither pain can ascend, nor hope, nor fear, nor anything else that can impair the authority of the highest good. Thither virtue alone can make her way. By her aid that hill must be climbed, she will bravely stand her ground and endure whatever may befall her not only resignedly, but even willingly. She will know that all hard times come in obedience to natural laws, and like a good soldier she will bear wounds, count scars, and when transfixed in dying will yet adore the general for whom she falls. She will bear in mind the old maxim, follow God. On the other hand, he who grumbles and complains and bemoans himself is nevertheless forcibly obliged to obey orders, and is dragged away, however much against his will, to carry them out. Yet what madness is it to be dragged rather than to follow, as great by Hercules, as it is folly and ignorance of one's true position, to grieve because one has not got something, or because something has caused us rough treatment, or to be surprised or indignant at those ills which befall good men as well as bad ones. I mean diseases, deaths, illnesses, and the other cross accidents of human life. Let us bear with magnanimity whatever the system of the universe makes it needful for us to bear. We are all bound by this oath to bear the ills of mortal life, and to submit with a good grace to what we cannot avoid. 
We have been born into a monarchy. Our liberty is to obey God. Book 16 True happiness, therefore, consists in virtue. And what will this virtue bid you do? Not to think anything bad or good which is connected, neither with virtue nor with wickedness. And in the next place, both to endure unmoved the assaults of evil, and, as far as is right, to form a god out of what is good. What reward does she promise you for this campaign? An enormous one, and one that raises you to the level of the gods. You shall be subject to no restraint and to no want. You shall be free, safe, unhurt. You shall fail in nothing that you attempt. You shall be debarred from nothing. Everything shall turn out according to your wish. No misfortune shall befall you. Nothing shall happen to you except what you expect and hope for. What? Does virtue alone suffice to make you happy? Why, of course. Consummate and godlike virtue such as this not only suffices, but more than suffices. For when a man is placed beyond the reach of any desire, what can he possibly lack? If all that he needs is concentrated in himself, how can he require anything from without? He, however, who is only on the road to virtue, although he may have made great progress along it, nevertheless needs some favor from fortune while he is still struggling among mere human interests, while he is untying that knot and all the bonds which bind him to mortality. What, then, is the difference between them? It is that some are tied more or less tightly by these bonds, and some have even tied themselves with them as well whereas he who has made progress towards the upper regions and raised himself upwards drags a closer chain, and though not yet free, is yet as good as free. Book 17 If, therefore, any one of those dogs who yelp at philosophy were to say, as they are wont to do, Why, then, do you talk so much more bravely than you live? Why do you check your words in the presence of your superiors and consider money to be a necessary implement? Why are you disturbed when you sustain losses, and weep on hearing of the death of your wife or your friend? Why do you pay regard to common rumor and feel annoyed by calumnious gossip? Why is your estate more elaborately kept than its natural use requires? Why do you not dine according to your own maxims? Why is your furniture smarter than it need be? Why do you drink wine that is older than yourself? Why are your grounds laid out? Why do you plant trees which afford nothing except shade? Why does your wife wear in her ears the price of a rich man's house? Why are your children at school dressed in costly clothes? Why is it a science to wait upon you at the table? Why is your silver plate not set down anyhow or at random, but skillfully disposed in regular order, with a superintendent to preside over the carving of the viands? And to this, if you like, the questions, Why do you own property beyond the seas? Why do you own more than you know of? It is a shame to you not to know your slaves by sight, for you must be very neglectful of them if you only own a few, or very extravagant if you have too many for your memory to retain. I will add some more reproaches afterwards, and I will bring more accusations against myself than you think of. For the present I will make you the following answer. I am not a wise man, and I will not be one in order to feed your spite. So do not require me to be on a level with the best of men, but merely to be better than the worst." I am satisfied if every day I take away something from my vices and correct my faults. I have not arrived at perfect soundness of mind. Indeed, I never shall arrive at it. I compound palliatives rather than remedies for my gout, and I am satisfied if it comes at rarer interval and does not shoot so painfully. Compared with your feet, which are lame, I am a racer. I make this speech not on my own behalf, for I am steeped in vices of every kind, but on behalf of one who has made some progress in virtue. Thank you for listening to this audiobook in progress. To hear more of our audiobooks in progress, please subscribe to this channel and like our videos. All of our completed audiobooks can be downloaded for free at copyleftaudiobooks.com. Thank you for listening and for your support.